Okay, so it's recording, but it's not quite started yet. So, hello, welcome to As Far As I Can Tell. My name is Kristen, and today I am with the one and only Henoch Elias, a Ethiopian by way of California and a deacon of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Um, so, first of all, um, Henoch, how are you today? What's an average Saturday morning for you? I'm doing well. Um, my, my Saturdays have been different, actually. Uh, gosh, I, I, when I grew up, they used to always involve soccer, or as you call it, football, over yonder, across the pond there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I also, while in college, actually was a rugger. So I used to play left and right flank. I don't know how familiar you are with rugby. So um, they used to be filled with Saturday. I used to have some rugby Saturdays too. They used to say Saturday's the rugby day. Mm. Um, more recently, probably spend time with the word of God and then spend time watching UFC fights as well. So the, the tensions and paradoxes between those, those two things as well. Uh, I wish you a little Shabbat Shalom because I picked up the Hebrew alphabet during this quarantine. Thank and you. so I don't have a lot of Hebrew vocabulary, but I, I know how to read some things now. Really, thank you. And I was just going to start with you talking about paradoxes. Um, yeah, I hear you were you started off as an intern for it was a was it a republic was it a libertarian? I don't know what you call them. There was a representative in your Congress. Yes. Yeah, so the Honorable Congressman Dennis J. Kucinich, mm -hmm. who. He's a hard man to categorize. Mm. I'll give you one anecdote about him. He's a Democrat, right? And he grew up, you know, his, his father was in the unions. And so he's very strong in the unions. He's very into animal welfare. Those are two things that I'm probably, you know, not the biggest fans of. However, the things that drew me to him is that he was one of the most fervent critics of empire. Mm. And so the kind of war on drugs in the United States as it just played out from Tricky Dick to the present, as well as the abroad foreign wars. He was very firmly against those things. And, and that kind of principle is very rare in any, in any of the two major parties, Democrat or Republican. In the Libertarian and Green parties, it's, it's, more, it's more common parlance, but those are really more minor, especially the Green party is very, very minor. We don't have a kind of flourishing parliamentary system like, like you all do. And, and even the British system is, 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 uh, is, you know, it could be more, it could be more, let's say, let's leave it at that. So anyway, he was the only Democrat who was critiquing Obamacare when it came out from what was considered the left. And we can get into what that means. But he was critiquing it from a progressive point of view, from the view that it was a compromise and that it was not the public option. It wasn't the government, you know, owning a, the means of production of health care and, and providing that for everybody. Instead, it's, it's some sort of amalgamation, what you'd call like an interventionist, uh, an in-between between the market economy and between state socialism. And he wanted something that was a more pure state socialism. So he was saying no. So President Obama takes him on Air Force One. Right. Now, none of us are privy to what he said to him. You know, we don't know if he threatened him in his life or, or if he convinced him through persuasion and reason. But whatever he said to him, he was the sole no vote on the Democratic side. As he got off that plane, he changed his vote. And so they got to say that with unanimity, the Democrats were behind Obamacare and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. Well, yes, I worked for him from yeah. September 2011 to December 2011 as his main legislative interns. There were a couple other interns there, um, but they were part time. I worked full time while, while doing my courses in the evening. So I actually got the, you know, I didn't have the best GPA, but I got the best GPA of college while working full time in his office no money, <laughs> unpaid internship, and then in the evenings taking uh, courses at Pepperdine University's satellite office in Washington, D.C. Well, I've got two questions. To you. Thank you for providing so much detail. Um, sorry, is, you've got a larger room. Is it echoing? Are you okay? I, I'm fine. Here, I'm, I'll, I'll mute it on my end so you don't hear it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, it's just, um, my question was, of course, you are a deacon of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And of course, as the old saying goes, and leave unto Caesar what is Caesar's, leave unto God what is God's. How do you, this was the surprise question, how do you feel you, you balance out your, say, political ambitions with your faith and your role as a deacon? Where, does, where, does, where do you draw the line for you? It's a great question. And in fact, there have been varying constitutions of various parishes, but traditionally in Ethiopia, actually they were one. This whole idea that church and state are separate is in history, a relatively new idea. It's 
an enlightenment idea that comes out of, you know, the two places that affected the world the most, the American constitution and the French constitution and the American revolution and the French revolution, they have their own particularities that make them separate. I think, for example, the idea of freedom of religion in the United States versus in the French revolution, you had freedom from religion. So I think that's a valid distinction between them, but they also had a lot of overlap and they had some of the same characters influencing them. For example, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and, and characters like that who would go back and forth. And uh, I'm sure I'm missing, you know, uh, other people there. Were, I'm sure there are way more links to be drawn from, but those are just a couple examples. So people feel so many different types of ways about it. And what's interesting is the Orthodox Church is hyper, again, these, these terms are a more traditionalist. And so what you see through our communion, which in, includes Egyptians and Armenians and Indians and Syriac or Syrians, you, you see a general conservatism or traditionalism that matches that. Now, what's different is that Ethiopians are the black Orthodox. And so there's, when you're in a diaspora like the United States, there are some senses in which you are, you're lumped in with that group as well, even if you don't match on everything. And, and you, do, you match on some things, you know. So in some ways, you know, I grew up feeling akin to some Hispanic immigrants and children of immigrants because of the language thing. In other respects, you know, I, I felt akin to, to my fellow black brothers and sisters because of the common way that we would be treated by perhaps the police or, or other institutional things. And so you see um, end up being Democrats. And, and, and so they want you to be progressive. And so there's a tension there between those things because there are going to be some obvious places where those run into each other. But overall, I would say my role is, is as a gadfly in politics. And so I think it's a pro people in the church to, for example, say liberate and free so-and-so, not necessarily incarcerate so-and-so. And so you won't see me very often or someone to be incarcerated, like lock her up or something like that. But you would see me say, for example, liberate so-and-so and free so-and-so. The old saying from 2016. And that's, I mean, that's interesting because I mean, you, you found, um, how did you find? Well, I was going to get into his um, Mintris Moldbug, and of course, he he was saying his his philosophy. I've only read the first book. Seems to be to provide um, detachment, and of course, Jesus worked as a as a as a beggar, as to say the Buddha. And if only like Mintris Moldbug could sort of believe, as it were, he would realize that's sort of the answer. Would you think that's accurate? That he's actually approaching some sort of um, Jesus-like detachment from from say almost sort of the material world to some extent to not sound sort of too Gnostic. Is that sort of how you kind of approach something like Mencius Moldbug? He's going through, through a sort of lens of providing, yeah, detachment, sort of like Mahatma Gandhi, that sort of thing. But a lot of what he's saying is about um, taking, not, not boxing people in, but providing a, an outside um, transcendent value to, to dictate events in his case, other than democracy. So it sounds almost, strangely Christian for a programmer. What do you think of that? I think, I think it's, it's close. It's close, but we have to be careful not to delve into the Gnosticism that you mentioned. Gnosticism, of course, an early heresy within the church, or you could say outside the church. And, and there's a way in which what his project is, from my understanding, I won't speak on his behalf, but from my understanding of his project, is that he sees an imbalance on the material. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's laying that critique on the material. But there is a danger of a misbalance on the other side too. The, the danger on the other side of being too much in the ethereal or the non-corporeal is, is what you mentioned, is Gnosticism. So it's not, it's not that you're only, you know, you're detached for the purpose of, of you know, leaving this realm and entering to another. It might, that, that might be more something that uh, your countryman Russell Brand would talk about on, on his show, as I've seen uh, several of <laughs> kind of his, his episodes and his spirituality. But rather, I, I do think there's a connection, you know, some of the, with some of the figures that you've, that you've mentioned, you know, namely, you know, Jesus is famous for saying, you know, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere for his head to rest. And so that kind of political homelessness, mm. that uh, philosophical homelessness, that, that's right. But, you know, what it is, is, you know, 
he's he's seen a, a lot of his project is this huge focus on World War II mm. and and the ideologies around there. And so you have the fascism of Italy and of Germany. You have the kind of mixture of fascism and the imperial tradition before that in Japan. Um, you have the, the, the Stalinism or the Marxism, whatever word you want to use to describe that regime. And then you have the victors, which are really, you know, the United States, the UK and France and, and what their ideology is, which is basically a soft or turned down version, of the Stalinist one. So it, it shows that there's, there are apparently three, and you could say that there are three, but there are really two because one is just the other one at a slower speed. And so what I would say is his probably ideal project is some admixture of all the, of the three, or if you want to say the two, and it's just right now that it's heavily leaning towards the, the, the victors of world war two. And so what I think he's trying to do is not be detached forever, but be detached so that you're not, you know, emotionally swayed by the politics of your day but to be prepared and to be ready for the moment in which you will transition into, you know, centrism isn't quite the right word because when you think centrism, you think of someone like Joe Biden or Kamala Harris who are now the uh, n nominees of the Democrat Party. But maybe, maybe let me say an authentic centrism, a centrism that, that looks at the farthest left and the farthest right and somehow synthesizes those into his own project. Yeah. And I get, I mean, to, to leave aside Munch's more bug uh, for, for a second and get back to yourself, um, one way to look at it would be, um, actually, I've lost my train of thought. That's, that's far too clever for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to you. So what, what would you say your, ah, no, here we go. That was it. Um, so what you're getting at is more that the, the reality of the emotion, so to speak, let's say that it becomes more real than the reality. So for example, the projection of, and again, this is Jungian, who was a Gnostic, but this is something I want to leave my own views out of this. But the um, the projection of, say, politics becomes more real than the real thing. So, for example, um, you yourself, an Ethiopian or, or some could say a black American could say, look at me and go, you're evil automatically because you follow the ideology of Black Lives Matter. You don't not not putting any, but somebody could. So I was going to say, um, how do you how do you feel about sort of identity politics? What is your identity fit in do you see yourself as american or ethiopian or just a mixture of the two and yeah how how are, how are current uh, say black lives matter type things are affecting you if at all yeah i i think um i the reason i was drawn to mention small bug and, and i'll take it away from him but the reason i was drawn is because there's a sort of a, a natural affinity to the sort of milieu in which he was raised and the milieu in which I was raised, and the way in which we are responding and reacting to modernity. It doesn't mean we, we line up on everything, you know, um, but as you saw the conversation on, on, on my channel on the philosophy of art and science, um, you know, we, we were able to agree a lot on, on critique and um, maybe replacement, we disagree, but, but at least critique and, and I'm sure a lot of replacement as well. We would have a lot of overlap. But in any event, identity politics for me is um, it's not, it's something that I don't write off, but it's also something that I don't lean into. And again, this goes back to the paradoxes and the tensions. And I think that that exists because everybody's trying to get you onto their team. And from my youngest of ages, this idea of factions and cliques is something that I don't know. I, I almost naturally revolted against, you know, in, in any sort of group I have ever been, I've always been the pariah, you know? So I think there's value in almost all of the major movements. And it's just about a manner of seeing and, and sifting through the wheat and the chaff of every movement and trying to, trying to glean whatever wisdom can be gleaned from that movement. So for example, I, I have no issue, you know, for example, with the hashtag, Black Lives Matter. I mean, it should, to me, should be a non, um, it should be a no-brainer. Um, but I have issue with some of the kind of statements on the various organizations' websites, the things that they stand behind, the metaphysics, the epistemology, and the, the ethics that they hold. 
but I think we would agree on the very basic notion that we should not have discriminatory policies by the police against black people, which is a, it seems like a, a basic point that many people would get along with. Now, some of the issue is that it, it gets expanded beyond that. And it's, um, you know, there's a process, I don't know if you're familiar with in the American governmental system called pork bellying, which is someone gets one bill that everyone agrees on and then just tack on everything else that everyone would find. Yeah, yeah, that they would find disagreeable. Exactly. And, and, and that's how, you know, that's how the Congress as a whole can have an absolutely horrendous, like in the teens approval rating, but every individual Congress person has super high ratings because they're all, you know, stealing money from the masses and giving it to their, their local people so that they're beloved locally, but as an institution, everybody, you know, disapproves of them. So when, when I look at, you know, the Black Lives Matter and even some of the people that are gaining prominence, someone, let's say, like Angela Davis is a very major thinker. Um, I'm very interested in, I don't, I don't have fully formed beliefs on the thought, but I am very interested in the organization Critical Resistance that she made and the uh, ideas around prison abolition, restorative justice, transformative justice as a form of uh, pursuing the kind of justice system in, in a country. Those are very interesting to me. At the same time, she supported the Stalinists. I'm firmly against Stalin and it's Stalinists. Stalin. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 Stalin, uh, the Russians, the Soviets, you know, and, and I'm firmly against, you know, Marxism of every kind. Does that mean that there's no valid critiques within the Marxist literature? No, but it surely means that whatever we're going to replace it with is going to be very different. And, and I'll, I'll never shy away from mentioning that. I was, I was on another program a couple of days ago, talking about a potential, you know, arguing about this definition of what genocide is and talking about some Orthodox Christians who've had their property stolen and who've been murdered recently in Ethiopia. And, you know, one of the things I made firm to do in that, in that conversation is to say that we need to have a more Anglo system of property rights and we need to rules of Marxist ideology. And I'm sure some people watching were upset by that, but you know, I, I was firm in in that in that stance. Mm. I mean, the English system is, or was, uh, you know, Englishman's home is his castle, and you have the right to protect it. Um, except, um, ironically, it's actually just here in Scotland where I am right now, and I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to discuss this, but as it's being passed through the, the Parliament, I probably can. That they actually the police in Britain actually rebelled against the Scottish government, and I was talking to a friend about whether the police could actually arrest the parliament because they brought in these hate speech laws, which essentially, are oh, you joke, but it, it could actually happen. They brought in these hate speech laws and essentially the police would have the right, um, as they do in England, actually, to, to um, break into your property. If they have any suspicion of, um, it's reversed. They have the right to enter your property. And as I often say, well, we've got to arrest the potential robber. Sorry, we've got to uh, break an end. We've got to break into your house you know, you might be potentially thinking of breaking into a house, you might be a robber. And that's how I get through to libertarians. But it's interesting what you say about embracing Anglo property rights. So you refer, it, thankfully, I should say, the police have said, um, we're not going to go through with this, because for one, we don't want the paperwork, and we don't want to look so bad. Um, they actually said this is this is sort of Hitler level of, of thinking. So, you know, God bless them there. But um, you were saying about Anglo property rights is that what you're referring to more more an Englishman's home is his castle sort of thing do you want to go back to that I would have thought that America had an even more extreme system everybody gets a gun so to speak yeah so the American system uh, you know I don't mean to to try to paint the UK as some sort of paradise you know I don't live in the UK so you know if the, if you say you know vote with your feet, you know, that's an example of one thing I haven't done. It's not worshiping, you know, a certain time and place of UK, but it's when you examine history writ large and you, you see the various systems. I, I went to law school and I studied dispute resolution. So for example, I had one professor from Germany who was teaching an arbitration course. And in that course, I learned a lot about the kind of continental European law systems, a lot of which are based off of statute. And when it's based off statute, it means basically whatever law passes, that's the new law. And it, it can change rapidly all the time. Whereas historically, what made the kind of common law system different, what you see in Hong Kong, what you see in Singapore, what you see in the United States, New Zealand, South Africa, all these places, Kenya, even Nigeria, like what these bases came from was this history 
of common law, of precedence, and a precedence establishing law. That came from the UK. Now, the American system in the beginning was a freeze frame of these ideals, you know, that begin in the Magna Carta and, and other such, you know, founding documents. And at the time of the establishment of the colonies in the United States, they had, you know, with, with all the imperfections that they have, you know, and at one point, you know, going back into the identity politics, I think, you know, in the Ethiopian context, you know, probably could consider me a monarchist more than anything else, although I'm not attached to any political ideology. In the American context, I'm, I'm not a monarchist. I would be a black Jeffersonian. You know, there's such thing as a Jeffersonian Democrat. Some people refer to it as a constitutionalist. But I'm very much interested in a lot of those founding documents. But obviously, as a black man, I was not written into those documents. Or from the beginning, I would have been three-fifths of a person and things like that from the documents itself. And so I have deep issues with those things while still recognizing the erudition of the men who crafted those documents. And so within that time, they're basically working off of a system uh, that originated in the UK, but that froze the frame before certain statutory elements got developed later and later. And so the closer to the, the present moment we got, yes, the UK system got worse. But if you, if you go back in time, there is this, this proud history of, of the decisions of judges and the precedents that, that really established common law that I think is, is, a, is a largely equalizing factor. And again, it, the, the terms even equalizing is, is dangerous, but I think it's liberatory or freeing in some sense. And it doesn't mean that it's perfect, but I think it's, it's probably some of the best jurisprudence that, that humankind has, has ever come up with. And, you know, I haven't, I need to study more, more forms of jurisprudence, but at least, at least like on a minor scale, if you compare the, that system to what they had in France and Germany, you know, I, I'll take the common law any day. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Because, um, it's interesting. So there's several things to touch on there. An Anglo system would make um, the police, for example, in the UK are public servants. And I always often say to people, that's, that's the way to go. Whereas I believe in, the, in America, it's, they are, there's a story I heard where, um, uh, is a good way of putting it, as you're a man of stories, a, a deacon yourself. There was a man on the, on the subway and he was being stabbed on the subway. So shocking obviously and on the next carriage along there were two policemen fortunately there was a marine on the on the happened to be on the subway i don't know if this is true or not but i believe it is there was a man on the there was a marine on the subway who basically just destroyed the guy being stabbed and got stabbed himself but after the man was obviously taken to hospital and all that he said to the police like why aren't you why aren't you seeing to the man and he and the police said no we're here to we're here to protect property he wasn't he wasn't damaging the train so I just thought, is that would that be a correct th thing? Where that the, the the police in the U.S. are there to protect property, I believe, more than anything, and aren't there to serve the public, which is where the contentions come in with um, Black Lives Matter. But I have another question on that. But I'll see what you think on the first point. Yeah, I wish they were only protecting property. I think that's more accurate of the firefighters. The firefighters in the United States, that's there. That's why no one has ever come up with a song titled F the Firefighters. You know, most black folk have no issues with firefighters. There may or may not be some sort of racism within there, but you don't see people protesting firefighters in the United States because primarily their job and their task, whether they're the most efficient at it or not, is another question. But their primary task is protecting property. The police... I think what's accurate and what, what you're getting to is, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there is a Supreme Court case in the United States where they found that it is not the job of the police to protect and serve. While that is their, their, um, their motto, the human beings, right? So I think that part is accurate. What they are there to protect and serve is far more dangerous and, and more similar to that German and French system. They're there to protect the statutes, and I think that's why we see such great injustices and such indignation on the side of, of black peoples and other people in the United States is because a lot of the, the laws on the books are unjust. And basically the police are enforcers of the law on the books, whether those laws are just or not. And some of them have some discretion and, and find more palatable ways to do it. But um, a, a lot of the, I think there's a filtration process of people who enter and then people who stay in that system who have a, a certain level of comfortability with following the law, whatever it is, which is, of course, you know, reminiscent of the, the defense of the, the Nazi party at Nuremberg, was we were just following orders. We were just being obedient.
Mm, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, how can I phrase this? I was going to say that's a great um, intro to this. Autism isn't great because um, people <laughs> will hear that. No, it's a great introduction to what I was about to say next, actually, because the very term um, uh, black or, or white in to it, just to just be white in Britain it's very odd we've imported this sort of American system I said I actually got into an argument with a um, sort of a woke type and I said like I'm, excuse me I'm, I'm not white I come from a continent with like 20 different like 90 different nationalities you know there's <laughs> like 90 different types of um, white and and of course it was actually white nationalism is an anathema because to have white you'd have to remove the nation state of Europe, and there was a man who tried this, Adolf Hitler, who tried to create a nation state of whiteness. And I was just thinking that, um, yeah, it, it's extremely, it's extremely, but you're thinking of importing American, uh, sorry, English ideals, we're trying to import British ones, but I don't think they hit British, they just hit British years, what years wrong, because we've had that empire and, and that sort of thing. Um, I forgot my, my main point there, but I guess mine would be, um, um, actually, let's just go for it. I've forgotten, I've completely lost my train of thought. The, um, I, have a, I have a question if maybe it's just a small point of clarification yeah. related to what you've said. For example, I, I was a part of this kind of pop-up university with the historian Thaddeus Russell, who had also interviewed Curtis on his program. And I got to have a little video chat with him reflecting afterwards. And I hope to one day get him as a guest. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that. But if I do, it would be great. And one of the things he documents in his American history is how when the, the Irish Catholics first came to the United States, you know, they were viewed by the scientific uh, racists as Negroes, amongst other groups like Italians and, and uh, Jews. So I, I, I don't know if that's part of what you're kind of getting that, but this idea, for example, um, Americans will loosely use the terms, for example, English and British, and it'll all, you know, it'll be everything, you know, for them. But I know, you know, there are Welsh, there are Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, Scottish, um, English. What, what, what type of differences do people see within, you know, those groups that others will, might try to blankly call white? In, in, in the UK, how, how are they perceived nowadays? Is there any well, distinction between those groups? It's a generational thing. So I would say most, that's the thing that the universe, the 20 somethings would just simply identify as, as white. And it's very odd. Whereas just, uh, it's one interesting way to put it is that in the 1980s in the UK, only around 10% of um, people went to university. In By today's standard, around 60%, 50 to 60 percent of 20 somethings do and that's what i mean it's a, it's an import of an american term that just they can say it all they want but it just doesn't fit um and so it's um it's extremely um sort of extremely odd and it goes back to the idea of like the projection of the reality becomes more real than itself and so we're almost trying to import a race war and it but it, it doesn't it it doesn't fit because the the foundations of the country were from three races and three races, three ethnicities, if you will. And we can divide that. And that's just Britain. Um, and I guess my point was to you was that where do you see this? Do you see America? Is it American nationhood? Would you say there are two sides to the argument where the left is concentrating on entirely subdivisions, which have genuine points that have, genuine it's a much younger country that's what i always say to americans you're so you're just like the the baby sort of thing the really successful guy that's just grown up you know you know I've, I've lived in houses older than your country and um and and we have the american system where it's make america great again you've got one national family and but the problem is with a in conservatism say and with the let but the problem is with a family is you've lost you might you might everybody might, might everybody um you might be you might miss a you might miss seeing a cousin you know what i mean so and and the left is sort of concentrating on the cousins the outsiders um i just thought of what what you think of that is it do you see america as a family or more how do you how do you balance things out but i i know what i meant this was this wasn't a question i wrote down but i just thought it'd be interesting to back and forth a little on this 
Yeah, that's good. It's uh, uh, you've established some for yourself and you've left some room for the spirit there um, or, or the ghost to use the more archaic English. So I, I think it's a, if it is a family, it's a dysfunctional family. But for me at this point, as I said, in, in my relation to politics, it's not, you know, as a politician per se, you know, amongst the Democrats, I liked Tulsi Gabbard. Um, she had no chance of winning, you know. Um, to an extent, and the libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen, uh, kind of excites me, not really. Her vice president, Spike Cohen, is far more exciting. And so I, I look at, at politics in the United States, not as uh, some future day is coming soon where we're all going to sing Kumbaya, but just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of hope in electoral politics. And so I believe more in the disruptive forces of economics that will not ask for the permission of these politicians, but will simply act. For example, how Lyft and Uber got into being, how Airbnb got into being. And right now in my state of California, Lyft and Uber are getting threatened. The legislator has passed laws that are that are changing the status of people from independent contractors to employees. And that would effectively destroy those companies. And so what is instead happening is a direct democracy in the state of California, which is different than other states in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so on the ballot, there's a proposition number 22, that if the people vote on it positively in November, um, it will overturn the actions of the bureaucrats of the state of California. So for example, I'm not interested in electing Donald Trump, nor am I interested in electing Biden. I am interested though, personally, as someone who used to be an independent contractor and who benefited from it and who may consider that route down the line, I'm personally vested in voting for this proposition uh, to throw this, to use direct democracy against the, the bureaucrats in charge. Do I, does that mean I think direct democracy is great? No, I, it means I'm pragmatic about the situation and on a local level, I don't mind using it to, to better my life in a, in, a, in a tangible way. But my job is simply to, to mock these politicians of, of every stripe and to try to enjoy my life and try to build a sustainable life. You know, I'm, uh, eventually, you know, get married, have kids and, and have my own community that does not rely upon the pursuit of happiness, to use one of the founding languages of the United States, within the realm of, of, of the big politics that captures most people's attentions. Like my only point in there is to be a gadfly and to mock the, the kind of idols and heroes of everyone else. Well, I'll, I mean, for one thing, um, the differences between us is that I'm, I'm struggling to keep up because it's almost like listening to a Frenchman because American, American is so quick. So every time I think of a point, I've lost it. But uh, one thing I would say with yourself is um, don't beat yourself down. One thing you're, you seem to be getting towards is um, to provide comprehension, not to give permission would that be correct and that's the role of a, a deacon and so i was going to say where would your would that be fair and, and when was your your calling really i mean it seems to be someone that that's fair that, that's fair when i was in college for example uh one of uh, it was a minor but i took basically as many courses as a major was philosophy and you know i studied all the major western philosophers and a lot of that philosophy is rooted in the Catholic Church. And my critiques of, for example, the Catholic Church and that system is an over-reliance. What, you know, what uh, Bishop Robert Barron in Los Angeles, the Catholic bishop, he refers to it himself, who's in that tradition, as hyper-rationalistic or scholastic. The difference between American English and British English, it's funny about the, the rate of speed. I was also a university debater and... Um, so that might have something to do with it. And part of, part of that tradition also, there's a, a different way in which parliamentary debate played out in the UK versus the United States. And I think there is slightly a more emphasis on, uh, on they call it spreading out, or making several points here in the United States. And maybe it's a bit slower in the, in the UK. And that might be pointing towards uh, some larger truth of, of the differences between them. But yeah, it's fair to say that it's related to my idea as a deacon. And so the Orthodox Church, especially Semitic speaking, you know, my, my original languages are Semitic languages. You know, English is my second language, although I was born here. And so the, the Semitic languages, which come out of the Orthodox Church, so specifically like the Syriac tradition of Antioch, and the Giz tradition of Aksum, of Ethiopia, where the Aksumit or the Abyssinia was referred to in the older historical texts, the point is not to debate. For example, St. Thomas Aquinas of the Western tradition is famous for having the Sume Theologia, where he would invite the public to come 
and he would have uh, his doctoral students underneath him engage the audience and have these long debates. And then he would have a few days of that. He would collect these things and then he would prepare his response as kind of the master. And these, these texts that people study in philosophy and in the Catholic church, those are, they originate in those public events. Whereas the kind of uh, public debate culture didn't exist really in Antioch Syriac or in, in the Giz tradition. Instead of debating, what we do is teach. People can either accept or decline the teaching, but we do not sit there and engage them in debate. We simply teach what, you know, what was handed down to us with new contextual examples. That would be giving um, permission, I guess. And would you have a specific, sorry, the internet is a little unstable here, but do you have, do you remember a specific line in a, in a book or something like that, a specific, you, or you must have done, surely it's such an um, incredible experience, I'd assume that, um, that um, do you have a specific line you read or a specific moment in your time where you went yep this is what i want to do uh, to 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 guide people i guess so for me one of i've had many influences in my life and uh, hopefully the other people don't feel salty as we say in black english or angry or upset that i don't mention them but the most influential teacher in my life has been a very interesting figure named father paul nadim tarazi I've, re- I've listened to many of his audio books. I've listened to many of his podcasts and I've read several of his books. I'm reading one now, which is a commentary on both Luke and Acts, which are written by the same author. And he is a very interesting figure. He is a Palestinian by kind of birth and origin of the Greek Orthodox church. He's lived in um, like Egypt, Lebanon, and Romania and the United States. So he, he was classically trained. So by his kind of birth and region, he knew Hebrew and Arabic. He was classically trained in Greek and Latin. He was a medical doctor before he began his, his biblical studies. He picked up Romanian as a language as well. And even within Arabic, you know, there are various dialects of spoken Arabic along with the kind of modern standard Arabic, which he also knows. And he famously, when I met him, was teaching for 40 years at St. Vladimir's, which is the premier Orthodox seminary in the United States. And I would say uh, being introduced to his kind of teaching in 2014 was a seminal moment for me. From 2014 till now is where I've had kind of the, the biggest change in trajectory. I was ordained a deacon in 2015 in December. And uh, so it, prior to that, I was teaching, but I really, really kind of increased to that once I was ordained. Uh, you know, these things happen, uh, Michael Malice says, both gradually and all at once. You know, it's a yes and rather than the kind of binaries and dichotomies people often point to. So I would say the teachings of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi brought me out of the hyper-rationalistic Western thought uh, in terms of metaphysics and ethics, um, away from the Eastern mysticism that is uh, Christianity mixed with Greek philosophy that a lot of Orthodox succumb to, and into the more traditional Syriac and, and schools, which emphasize teaching and parables and illustrations and not, not engaging others in debate, but letting your life itself, you know, be the, the debate as it were. And, and again, some of these things, they're not clear distinctions. Francis of Assisi, I think, is an example of a, of a Western saint who is often quoted by, uh, you know, secular as, as well as religious folks as someone who preached the gospel with his life rather than with words. And that if I am engaged in debate, I think it's, it's with the way I'm living my life rather than sitting down and, you know, asking someone how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, as is the stereotype of the kind of medieval scholasticism. Yep, you'll forgive me if I don't seem like I'm responding. I'm just trying hard to listen. And you said you were... Um... Uh, your influence, but you mentioned Michael Mannes there, and obviously Curtin Yav- Curtis Yavin himself. And I'll detach my own personal beliefs on uh, religious beliefs from this. But you, you yourself, uh, obviously Michael Mannes, Curtis Yavin are Jewish individuals who are an, a diaspora, and of course, uh, you yourself have become the Ethiopian. Those become the Ethiopian diaspora. Is that which you think that's where you, that's how you sort of found them? Where even subconsciously you sort of gravitated towards a a diaspora and that's a word way of thinking what do you think about that do you think the ethiopian nobility could become say like the jews became where the, the, the ones that left could travel and provide 
wisdom. I'm sounding a little like a pagan magazine, but you know what I mean? Um, do you feel, do you feel that? Do you feel that there's some sort of diaspora being created or do you think there will be a return home without say the controversy of Israel, for example, that there is, there's an Ethiopia to return to? How do you feel about that? Your diaspora and thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not financially feasible for me right now. And, and there are other things that hold me back. I would, I would ultimately love to return and be involved, although I'm, you know, there are many things about me which are very Western. And so it might turn out to be, you know, six months here, six months there, nine months here, three months there. I don't know what combination, um, but I have a longing for it. It's been nine years since I've visited. And by now my grandmothers have passed. And so I used to visit them. They used to have houses on the same street and I used to be able to visit them, you know, on the same day. And uh, they were very influential. I still have, of course, many cousins, and, and we use that term very loosely. I don't, I don't know if you count just your first cousins, but you know, we count everyone up to seven generations as our cousin. And so, um, you know, and, and we, we know a lot of them. Um, seven might be a bit much, you know, we, but five and less, we pretty much know all of them. And so, you know, I have a lot of them back there, and, and I would love to link with them. And I think ultimately I would like to go back to Ethiopia uh, if the right opportunity met itself. But, you know, as of now, you know, I'm, I'm a firm child of the West. There's no getting around it. And one of the freedoms granted to me is to critique it. But in being in the West, because I have these differences, this diaspora that you mentioned, I think people of diaspora communities have an ability to, to think outside the box or look at the situation in a slightly different fashion than let's say the people who are more traditionally or, or the more dominant culture by not being a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I think I was able to uh, have a slightly different edge of the eye. Uh, again, another thing Thaddeus Russell and other thinkers have pointed to is the, the prevalence of what are considered extreme or different ideologies of uh, Jews and Catholics in the United States. So I t Italians, Irish and the Jews, because they were not that dominant, a wasp culture, they were able to, you know, feel different from a young age, which prepared an environment in which they could pick something. But ultimately, you know, these things are true of averages, but not of individuals, because every individual could will themselves differently. But it certainly presents a milieu or a context, the setting in which I think those people, like, for example, Michael Malice came as an infant, but he was a, an immigrant. Um, but, uh, um, Moldbug, I think, was not an immigrant. I think uh, his, his diasporic nature is a little more distant. Mm. I'm sorry, I just wondered if you could repeat the last one minute of what you said because the, it sort of did that robot voice thing and slowed down. So if you could, if you maybe could summarize those the last 30 seconds of what you said there, apologies. It's very interesting. No, no worries, bruv. Uh, so what I think is that the diasporic element is more obvious to Michael Malice because he's an infant, right, from, I believe, the Ukraine uh, while it was under the USSR. Curtis, I believe, is, is more American-born and, and so um, a little bit closer to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, but I do believe he has some Jewish roots on, on at least one side. I don't know if it's his mother or his father. And uh, I think that, that the Jews, Catholics, and Orthodox, by not being you know, of the dominant white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture have an environment or milieu and setting that would allow them to think out the box more so than others. But I think you will find plenty. That already exists because ultimately there's a role for individuals. But I think to your point, there is some diasporic link going on there. Mm. And so, um, I mean, as the old saying goes, well, I think it's many grains of sands make it make a diamond, but you can't balance a, st uh, a state on a diamond sort of thing. And and so you've and so you you, show, you feel that sort of taking place that that um, that it's yeah that's excellent. Um, I'm sorry, I've seemed a little flustered. It just you cut out there, and so I lost my um, anyway. Um, <laughs> it completely cut out. So I was listening to. I'm seeing you pause and then you speak and that's really interesting you do see a sort of link coming across and so my next kind of point would be um detachment and, and democracy so as someone with a feet in two camps one in ethiopia and in the us um specifically living in as you said sort of currently left is los angeles um how does that really affect your um your, your view of culture do you as a friend of mine said if you could sum it up would you say it gives you a sort of superpower that you're completely above it all 
would that be a good summary or Yes, that's a it's a good uh, summary. And like I said, I think even terms like leftist, rightist, they're used in so many different ways. I, I tried I tried to find the more precise terms because, for example, if we have this left right axis, the question is: Is the person who's most left is it someone who's is trying to establish an anarcho syndicalism of Noam Chomsky, or is the farthest left someone? trying to establish some sort of uh, totalitarian uh, Stalinistic Marxist state. You know, they both can't be the left. And those, those are different, you know. Um, Noam Chomsky, uh, he could be called a leftist, but so could Stalin. And so, um, but, but, but to your overall point, yes. I mean, I think it, it, your friend's point, it is, a, it is a superpower of sorts. It's one of my great delights. As I told you, I like being a gadfly. I like being humorous and mocking of, of the system writ large. And, and it gives a, a sort of mysterious air to me because, yes, some people would think I'm sort of a cookie cutter Black Lives Matter person. Other people um, think I'm a, a black conservative and there's a whole meme around black conservatives in the United States. And so they don't know quite what that means to some people. You, you know, is he a monarchist or is he an anarchist? Is he a traditionalist or is he a radical? Is he a primitivist or is he a technologist? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's there that, you know, it, they're, they're not sure what to make of me. And there is some delight that I have in some of um, it cuts off straight at the end there, but I guess you said in some way, I think I can lip read. So again, so to, to mock things, you're being on the edge. And so you sort of have the luxury and the pain of also being on, on the edge of something, but able to look in. And one uh, group of people that are able to do that would be, say, a prince, not a king. They're somewhere between the two. And as I incorrectly said, you know where I'm going with this, I, I said the title of my piece was A Prince in Los Angeles. But apparently on, you're not a prince, you're a descendant your descendants, however, were sat on the throne. So let's go on to that. How do you feel about ruling everything with an iron fist, Enoch? So it's, it's, it's uh, funny. You know, the word prince could have multiple meanings. In the Bible, the word prince is often translating this word that means ruler. And so in, in the sense of just kind of ruler or leader, the, you know, my, my family is, is mixed. It's um, Samuel Clemens, the author known as Mark Twain, had a famous book, The Prince and the Pauper. I'll give you two of those categories and I'll add a third, right, that you mentioned. The prince, the pauper, and the priest. Mm. And so I've had family who were princes, those who've been um, the consorts of multiple emperors over the past 200 years, have relationships, blood relationships to me, and if you go back uh, far enough, you will find several people who sat on the throne themselves. At the same time, I have family members that were destitute and poor farmers just making enough to sustain themselves. At the same time, I have family who were priests, using the term priest loosely to just say clergy, men of the cloth, if you will. And so I have, I have family background from, from all of those things, from princes, paupers, and from priests it's uh, particularly the the priests and the the princes the thing that made them different and what makes ethiopia you know unique in africa and unique in, in many other respects is that the giz language that i mentioned earlier is the script and the written language and so the ability to write down so my grandfather wrote a memoir and i never heard about these princes from my parents but from his memoir i learned of it and um, on my, that's on my mother's side. On my father's side, there are many clergy. And his mother, my maternal, my paternal grandmother, wrote a book along with many of her relatives that detailed this. And I, I learned from meeting a lot of them how many of them were clergy. Herself, the, the daughter of a priest uh, who, who herself married my grandfather, who was a deacon. And she wasn't just the daughter of a priest. She chanted the traditional Psalms of David, meaning to recite them out loud better than all of her, her male cousins and brothers who were men of the cloth. And, and so, you know, there's something of uh, Orthodox Christianity that may have leaped my parents and gotten to me from, from those people who were princes, paupers, and priests. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't actually literally mean to rule things with an iron fist. You'll notice with Englishmen, they'll do a literal point and then throw you off with a comical one. That's sarcasm there. Maybe it's something to do with my own Jewish heritage to sort of do, off, do away with distract mobs, as it were. But um, 
the um my point was to, to how did you how did you literally arrive in my point was more literal how did you um literally arrive in, in ethiopia and how, how yeah how do you feel being part of royalty but you touched on that yeah i see i see so uh, <laughs> my fault that's my fault uh, not 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 catching the the figurative versus yeah. the literal there yeah. um but that's to your credit so you. um <clears throat> My parents moved here, you know, as uh, documented legal immigrants in the, uh, you know, some 50 years ago. And uh, so, you know, um, I, I'm their child and they came from Ethiopia before that. Gosh, I mean, I'd have to go through my family history, but <coughs> I, I think maybe nobody has left Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah right. I think nobody's left Ethiopia right. before my parents. Right. And was that, was that because I don't. Well, you don't have to answer this because it might be upsetting, but is that because of the, because of the dirge? Is that, um, or was that, yeah, obviously it was because of the, obviously because it was. Well, they, they left prior to, hmm. um, but there was, you know, there was a coup in the sixties that failed. And then in the seventies, um, being of the relatively privileged backgrounds that both of them were, you know, the poorest of people would not have been able to trek to the United States. And that's something that has to be noted, but being of the relatively privileged backgrounds. And it's a, again, it's a different contextual matter because there they were privileged, but well off when they came here, they were, they were certainly more poor in the beginning and, you know, kind of fulfilled the American dream. Mm. But uh, being that they were there, you know, their parents had inkling that something was going to happen. Nobody could quite know that the absolutist monarchy would be overturned for a, a, a military junta communist regime. But they had inklings that it was close. And the original plan was for them to go get educated college. They both graduated high school in, in Ethiopia. And my father even completed a year at the emperor's university before coming here. And the, the original plan is, you know, go get your education in the West and return. Um, what they did not, you know, perceive happening was the level of kind of violence that erupted from communism and you know I, I don't know the exact numbers but they spent some almost 20 years without you know seeing their parents and other family and and in fact you know my my paternal grandfather he passed away in that time so I never even met him he's my one grandparent I never met and you know you know, it's like my father never got to see him again <laughs> Yeah, um, that so that, that's, you know, that's how it happened. Um, I mean, one thing we could get into if I come onto your channel is what it's like to sort of be brought up without a family, but that's a different thing. It'd be an interesting discussion and in how I found my own faith. But um, the, the, so what you're getting on is um, the, so you forgive me if I don't sort of give a, a specific answer back when you come to questions of religion. It's just, um, it's about you. Anyway, I can talk about myself all day. So um the what you're getting to is that they were detached from ethiopia but um was that similar to the marxist system of the sense that in cambodia like anyone who wore glasses would simply be uh considered an intellectual were they intellectuals there and if you followed in in their intellectual footsteps by doing what you're doing yeah they they uh they were i mean they were high schoolers and first year of college so i would struggle to say intellectual per se but yeah there's they went to elite private schools you know what I mean? Um, so they were, you know, they're part of the the highly educated modern modern folks who who threw away the kind of beauty of the of the past. And you know, I have some hope that my efforts in some way may bring a, a more measured way, not to just revert to the past as a kind of basic form of reaction but to examine, you know, what was everything beautiful and good about the past and how could we use homegrown institutions and, and cultures while, while mixing with whatever is beneficial in, in the present moment. Mm, that's, yeah, just the time to reflect on that really. And um, how do you, I was just going to jump to a question about immigration, but it doesn't seem particularly, um, seems a little crass right now on that point. I'm sorry, a lot of tearing up just thinking about uh, the destruction of history frankly and that's something that's that's you your your family have carried forward with you you know history and he's where do you see um the perception of history going in the states with all that's going on with the statues and that sort of thing do you see sort of hope that it's i, I mean personally i think it's kind of reached its peak um that you can't really go more forward without going into anarchy but um where do you where do you, do you have a 
where do you see how do you see other people seeing the past within your community and just within american friends you know who may or may not be ethiopian yeah in the ethiopian communities i mean there's a resurgence and uh there's always this sort of deep sense of nationalism and pride in there and we have our own issues that we are working out but i do see this kind of more excitement for you know what you said you sorrowed over kind of beauty of the past and incorporating it with what we have now in the general american communities like you said i think i agree with you i think it's on some sort of precipice i don't want to be out here as a nostradamus and try to give an exact date or prediction of, of collapse but yeah it, 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 the current system the status quo does not seem sustainable and so one of the errors people had is the the arrogance of worshiping their moment in time and place this kind of uh, early 90s Fuka, fukuyamian belief that we had achieved the pinnacle of what it means to be a human the 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 kind of secular humanism and the the democratic party and you could say progressivism or leftism or however you want to define it is this uh, ethereal force moving history along carrying martin luther king's moral arc of the of the universe but with their own you know their own interpretation of where that moral arc was going and i think the 2016 election of donald trump the kind of election of uh, bolsonaro in brazil and i know the hungarian situation less but the the, the Hungarian situation, the Singaporean situation, and I think a lot of other situations that almost happened in France, you know, almost a uh, right-wing populist uh, revolt in France as well. I, in Greece, you see some of these elements as well. What, what I think it points to is like, history is far more a pendulum than it is linear. And I think everyone was on this linear train and it's, uh, you know, it is my joy to, to drink their tears as they uh, come to realize that this linear future of theirs is, is not quite happening. Not everybody's on, on the same train. Well, to quote um, an, the um, Ashashian as version of Islam, it says the paradise should be found through the tears of God. So, I mean, if you want to go that week, you can do. And they're not around anymore, thankfully. But um, one thing, one way to look at it would be, uh, you, you mentioned as a right wing populism and yourself coming from um, Ethiopia. Where do you, do you have any, are you in touch with the, goings on when it comes to African migration are you aware of the African migration to to Europe and the million or so migrants that came to Europe that led to the the potential rise of um what's the name Le Pen um do, are you, how do you how do you feel about that if at all and if you know of anything of like what's Ethiopia's role in that and what do you think of it yourself as both an Ethiopian and an, having family from Africa who were my who were genuine migrants and and yeah yeah I, I i am aware of it i'm no expert on the subject but I'm, I'm aware of it kind of tangentially i've seen a film about it you know i've read the articles in the various kind of media outlets about it you know i can't say i've sat down and read a book on the subject and um you know i know people personally you know who, who during things like that i know about these ships that get turned over in the mediterranean sea and a lot of them die trying to get there I know about the situation of especially Ethiopian and Eritrean migrants to Israel and through the through the Sudanese and Egyptian deserts, and they have uh, various. Uh, we call them in the in the Mexican American situation. We call them coyotes. These kind of people who shepherd them along through the desert to make make these journeys. So I, I know that's happening. I know people point to the Scandinavian countries often as these places of paradise but then you know well, as soon as the uh, the ethnic makeup starts changing people start questioning it in the american setting my debate professor introduced to me this idea and this history of what the united states was supposed to be that's why i say it's contextual and and so this idea of open borders was put into me in college and the united states basically before world war one had open borders and, you know, that's the kind of idea of the Statue of Liberty that we received, you know, from the French government and the kind of mottos of come here, you weary. It's almost like a, a, a Jesus-like um, ability to invite the stranger, invite the guest to come in. And on a personal level and on a communal level, I'm, I'm deeply attached to that because it is ultimately the, the Christian and in larger part, the Abrahamic mes message to Judeo-Christianity and Islam. What they all agree on is Abraham and Abraham is most famous for receiving guests, for receiving the stranger, the, the, the sojourner, the exile. 
And so I have that, that deeply in me. In the Ethiopian context, you know, what exactly does that look like? Um, there are, uh, he was, he was, uh, some people have the idea of a demographic change in Ethiopia with the Chinese and predominantly Chinese men. And, and so, you know, what does that look like? What is that? How does that change the mores and attitudes of a place? Those are interesting questions that I think right wing folk enter. And so I understand the people who are more border restrictionists and I'm, I'm not in a position of power. And so I don't, I don't really have a, a view on it from a European perspective because I'm not in Europe and I don't have the skin in the game. Wouldn't be proper. I'm not in Ethiopia right now. And so making the decision for Ethiopia, you know, what, what should the borders be and how should they protect? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I do know that the current laws and the way they are represented in the United States are, they're pretty arbitrary. And so I would, I'm a principled man, a man of ideas. I would like to see a more kind of um, intelligent um, uh, proposal to do that. I've seen Nassim Nicholas Taleb and his, his, the kind of people around him in the Real World Risk Institute that he runs mention a, a sort of what they consider be a sane plan of, of migration and, and in limiting it. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear more on it. So again, I have these kind of basic ideas. If you don't mind this turning into more of a discussion than an interview. If you don't mind this turning into more of a discussion than an interview, and I'll just check the time. Yeah, it should be fine. Um, I actually met a Mexican uh, Mexican criminal here. A little that I know, and uh, it's interesting. That I was the as an outsider, I was the only one that picked this up. He came in on his motorbike and everything else. Obviously, dealing drugs. Um, small guy, but you just you just knew. Um, and it was odd because he actually looked like my brother who I lost a couple of years ago. And I said, he looked just like him. Um, yeah, he doesn't, we, we were twins, but he looks absolutely nothing like me. Um, and um, he actually gave, he, well, he actually gave uh, my mother a small skull. I think I've got it somewhere. I wish I had it on me. <laughs> he gave a death skull to my mother as a sort of sign of respect. But he came and he said, oh no, I give this to everybody. And um, it's, it's just, and I thought, no, no, this is your calling card when you're doing drugs. But the fact that he was allowed to like detach and give a gift. Uh, the other thing was, it's, it's amazing that the Mexican immigrants seem to view Britain as a paradise. Like he looked at the small apartment and went, like, you wouldn't be able to do this here. There'd be chain wire, there'd be wire, everything else. And yet I've moved here. I, I can't say much more. I've moved to a different country in, um, in, from England because of the situation with the, the migrant situation in England, where England had just gone. Um, the other one was in London, where I nearly got uh, basically mugged. This is, this, is, this is funny in a way that detachment can give you something. Um, he, the South African guy, he comes up to me, he's obviously on drugs, and he came up to me, and he, he, he was going to knife me, right? But he said, and he said, um, he said, have you got money? You've got money? And I, 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 had, this, I had this blue suit on, right? So, like, aqua, aqua, no, like sky blue suit, looked, looked absolutely crisp but I had no money. I had nothing. I had a suitcase with like laundry on it. And that was it. I was, I was homeless myself. And so I like, I couldn't be mugged because I had nothing. And so there's a sort of, there's sort of a detachment there. And he was like, Oh, do you want to die? And I just, I looked him dead in the eye and just went, yes. And, and that's the best thing you can do just to have courage and just go, yeah, just, just sort of detachment. So heck of a life. Um, but I just wondered if stories like that might help you understand what's going on, you know, in Europe. So that was that. Yeah, no, it's it's helpful, and again, I, I don't have uh, fully formulated thoughts on the matter. Especially, I don't I don't presume to you know um, tell other uh, European nation states what their what their policies um, should be. But it does seem that you know America was kind of established on this certain ideal, and maybe 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 America wants to change that, and so maybe there needs to be constitutional amendments and whatever it may be to to have a more um, rigorous and, and scholarly approach to to that filtration system but yeah um that's that's about all i could say i, I know on the subject mm, okay that's i mean yeah everything helps and i hope we've helped each other on that one um i don't know if we've got really time to well we've got to really because we've barely touched on ethiopia itself um how do you see um with, do you, do you, the um, establishment of the Ethiopian regime, um, to come, as an Englishman, my own parents, the, again, going into more of a discussion, but it's important that we were taught that the, uh, well, there's two things. One, virtue signaling. Okay, I remember back then. We, we, had to, we had to wear these wristbands in school, right, that said, I'm against poverty. Now, who's against, nobody's against poverty, right? So you speak out, shh, 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 
no grades, right? Primary school, that's a Marxist level of thinking. At the same time, the reason Africa, we were supposed to wear these wristbands was to give to Africa, right? Because like Europe's one country, it's not obviously, but we were supposed to give these, this money away was due to a Marxist regime in um, Ethiopia. And I was really wondering like, how did that, how did that come about? How do you feel when it's kind of, how does it rub up against you and somebody might say, well, it's just the droughts were just sort of climate change, something like that, when you know better. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? that how, so there's two questions there. How did, the, how did the dirge come about in 10 minutes? Um, how do you see, do you feel that it's, it's exhausted itself or do you see that? Or, and my second one was, how do you feel about virtue signaling in general, I guess? And, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we can uh, we can close after after this one, um, but say, basically, uh, there is this history of kings, like I said, up until 1974, 1975, and this last king, the emperor Haile Selassie, who is worshipped by the Rastafarians. You know, Ras means Duke in Amharic, and Tafari uh, was his name, right? It means the feared one, but he takes his baptismal name. Name, which means the power of the Trinity when he's an emperor. But anyway, his name was Rastafari when he, Tafari, when he ascends to the throne, he's emperor. I'd have to check the history again, but he's one of the longest ruling, if not the longest ruling emperors. And you, you know, as I said, there was a failed coup attempt against him in the sixties, but there are also a successful one in the seventies. And so I think his issue is he didn't pick enough of firm successors to kind of let go of that power. He had a lot of issues with kind of colonial regimes, right? He was in charge when Benito Mussolini invaded. He had issues with, uh, you know, former culinary, uh, colony territories of Italy, including like Eritrea and parts of the Somaliland, which border Ethiopia, and whose ethnicities and peoples also exist in Ethiopia, some of whom to a greater extent than they do in, in these other countries. I, mean, I don't know the size of Somalia, and Somalia is itself three different nations, but Ethiopia, for example, is about 110 million people. You know, Eritrea is about five, six million so, you know, he's running this country, which was admittedly smaller back then. And people have legitimate grievances and they're, they're brought up, one of the first few generations brought up on holy Western education. And so the same kind of intellectual wave that took over the world took over there. And you have the American side and the, the Russian side fighting a proxy war in, the, you know, in the Ethiopia. And eventually, you know, the Russians or the Soviets win over. And so they get the Sovietism in a, an explicit way throughout the 70s and 80s. After uh, USSR crumbles in 89, in 1991, a new regime begins. The new regime is not explicitly Marxist, but most of the people educated are the same people educated in the old school. They're more this uh, Tigrinya speaking, which is one of the many languages of Ethiopia minority groups. And they have been ruling now from 91 to the present. They've had three different prime ministers, one who, who passed away, um, one who quit the job, and then the current one, and the current one is more ethnically diverse and more politically diverse, and he's trying to bring about change, but now there are issues that he's dealing with with various ethnicities, some people who want to uh, turn their states into smaller states, and other people who want to actually secede from the nation state who do not identify as, as Ethiopian nationalists. So I'd say it's a mixture of kind of foreign influence and foreign ideas based off of modernized education and the abandoning of the studying of the of the Giz language writ large by elites, except for those in the church and who love the church. And the kind of, uh, like I said, legitimate kind of grievances of, of the poor and, and the marginalized within within that society. But yeah, as you, as you mentioned, I, I know who's to blame for these famines, for these droughts, for the, the destitute poverty. And part of that is like, again, I'm like you and being detached. And it's incredible the kind of story you told about you know, your life being threatened, that, that's terrifying. And it's impressive that you, that you were able to be detached even in that, in that situation of duress. But I'd say that beyond politics overall, and this is another thing, you know, going back to Curtis, where Curtis and I agree more than any particular political system, what I'm attached to is the idea of Austrian economics, which, you know, which is, you know, Misesianism and Rothbardianism, and, and uh, you could put their history and politics aside and focus just on kind of their economic analysis. And I'd say more, more so than anything else, I'm attached to what I believe are the truths that come out of Austrian economics. 
and then how you apply a political program in response to what I believe are the truths of Austrian economics, that is up for debate and up for change and, and should contour to the context of whatever situation one is in. Well, I would just like to say that you seem like a, a king. Uh, sorry, no, you don't. So, I, I was just going to say that a king, a president, a Marxist has pride, but a Christian has pride in humility. And you seem like a man that has pride in humility and detachment and enjoy the leadership of your own life. And on that, I'm going to have to say goodbye. So thank you for coming on. And thanks for this hour. You've been amazingly succinct. Goodbye. Thanks for having me. <laughs>